You might recall that the voltage across a capacitor will not change instantaneously. The current, however, can change instantaneously. Because the voltage is, you could say, difficult to change across a capacitor, we expect that voltage to lag behind the current in a capacitor, and that's exactly what happens. Let's take a look at it. We've got an AC voltage source here in parallel with the capacitor. Because the capacitor is in parallel with the voltage source, the voltages are just equal. We might recall that the current through a capacitor is just the capacitance times the time derivative of the voltage. Let's find the current flowing into this particular capacitor. There's a trigonometric identity that relates sine and cosine. So I can just write the cosine of omega t as the sine of omega t plus 90 degrees. We can see that there's a 90 degrees or pi over 2 radian phase difference between the voltage and the current in a capacitor. I'd like to go ahead and plot those waveforms. Because it's difficult to change the voltage across a capacitor, we expect that the voltage would lag. For example, if we start from this point and increase the current, we can see that it takes some time for the voltage to catch up to us. We can therefore say that the voltage lags the current in a capacitor. Let's define the amplitude of the current as Im. The units of the voltage is just volts, and the units of current we know must be ampere. Therefore, the units of peak voltage must be volts, and the units of peak current must also be amperes. Looking back at my definition for the peak current, I sub m, we know that this is in amperes. Capacitance C is in farads. V sub m is in volts, and omega is in radians per second. And it's true that this relationship must hold. We also know that current equals voltage divided by resistance. Therefore, farads times radians per second should give us units of inverse ohms. This quantity, 1 over c omega, has units of ohms, and it's called the reactance of the capacitor. As the frequency gets higher and higher, the reactance of the capacitor gets lower and lower. The opposite was true in an inductor. The frequency was in the numerator of an inductor. As the frequency gets higher and higher, the reactance of an inductor gets larger and larger. I'd like to calculate the instantaneous power through the capacitor. Let's first look at the waveforms. We can see that in this region, both the voltage and current are positive. Therefore, the power should also be positive. In this region, the voltage is positive, but the current is negative. Therefore, the power should be negative. In this region, we have both voltage and current negative. So the power flow should be positive. And finally, we have the current as being positive and the voltage as being negative. Therefore, the power should be negative. You can see that we have a very similar situation in the capacitor as we had in the inductor. Sometimes the capacitor stores power, and then sometimes the capacitor gives back the power. So we could have a problem if we naively think that power always flows from the source over towards the capacitor. No, sometimes the capacitor causes power to flow back to the voltage source. This can be a problem in real life power generation facilities. If the load is reactive, sometimes power can flow the wrong way along the power lines, and that's something we generally want to avoid. That can be avoided by making sure that loads, in general, are resistive. Because if you have a resistive load, power will tend to flow towards it rather than away from it. That's not true in a capacitor or an inductor. Let's calculate the instantaneous and average power flow into this capacitor. With the sign convention I'm using, a positive sign in the power means that power is flowing into the capacitor. A negative sign on the power means that power will be flowing out of the capacitor. And it's important to keep those sign differences straight. Power is just voltage times current. Now that we have the instantaneous power, I'd like to find the average power. In other words, what flat line on this graph would give me the same power flow on average as the instantaneous power? Let's integrate over one period because beyond one period, the signal is just periodic. This is the definition of average. We have some constants to pull out from under the integral. As we've seen in the video on inductors, this integral is just zero. I can also see that it's zero by inspection because these are what are known as orthogonal functions. A sine is orthogonal to a cosine. So if you integrate over a period, 
then the integral is going to be zero. The average power is just zero, and it makes a lot of sense because a capacitor cannot burn up power. There's no resistor in it, it's just a capacitor. The only resistance that we might have is parasitic resistance that we've not modeled here. Over time, a capacitor might store energy, or it might release energy. It might instantaneously accept power from the rest of the circuit, or it might instantaneously push power away. But on average, a capacitor will not consume or supply power. This video is part of an organized sequence where I explore various AC and switching circuits. If you enjoyed it, then you might consider following the channel's playlist to learn more about these types of circuits.